Did you know that there are over 2,200 known religions in the world? We are all born into one belief, religion, or faith, which influences how we see the world and everything and everyone in it, including ourselves. Do our beliefs divide and separate us, or do they bring us together in greater harmony? When you look up with awe on a star-filled night, do you ask who or what created all of this? Have you ever had a profound or deeply challenging experience in your life that changed your beliefs at the core of your being? Enlightened Pathways takes us on a journey of discovery to understand just how spiritual transformational experiences impact our lives and the world around us. Join us now as we deeply explore all that nourishes, heals, and inspires us. Welcome to Enlightened Pathways. Welcome to Enlightened Pathways. My name is Robert Kabeca, and I am your host for today's show. And my special guest today is Tobias English. Welcome, Tobias. Hello, hello. Hey, brother. Thank good you for being you. on the show. Yeah, it's good to see you, too. I appreciate your being here. Uh, I've known Tobias for about four years when I first moved to Portland, Maine. And he was one of the first few people that I met here. And it's been a wonderful journey uh, getting to know him. We're going to have lots of opportunity to talk about that during the show. I'm certain that the universe had a specific intention for us to meet because uh, Tobias has uh, significantly enhanced my spiritual journey uh, over the past few years. And, uh, Likewise. Like what? <laughs> We're going to get into likewise. that. Likewise. Like, no, no, it's mutual. Oh, likewise. Likewise. Yes. I thought you said, mutual. like what? It's like, what do you mean, like what? <laughs> so it's awesome. You know, so let me tell you a little bit about Tobias. Um, he just moved from Portland down to Asheville, uh, North Carolina, which he absolutely loves. Um, he is a uh, autodidact uh, like me, which we, means we're pretty much self-taught in a lot of ways. Uh, however, he is an accomplished musician and uh, certified in many healing methodologies. He's a licensed massage, massage therapist. Uh, he does body talk, health kinesiology, holographic repatterning, and is about to get certified in core transformation as a certified core transformation coach, uh, which is really, really cool. Um, I got certified in core transformation uh, a year ago. Uh, it has transformed my life, um, and I know it's had a positive impact in his life as well. And so, uh, oh, also, uh, yes, I am reading from cards because there's a lot to talk about with Tobias here. Uh, and he also has a renewed passion for Advaita, which he is going to talk about as well. So welcome, Tobias. Thank you for being on the show. It's so good to see you, Roberto. Yeah. Uh, again, we again. through technology, we're lucky enough to see each other occasionally, yes. even though I've moved away. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So, uh, yeah, we're going to have a great conversation here. And, you know, why don't we just get started with just me asking you, you know, what kind of religious belief were you brought up into or belief system, faith were you brought up into as a kid? And what kind of impact that might have had on your early life, you know, whatever you're comfortable talking about? Sure. I, uh, my, my folks were Protestant, but not particularly observant. We went to church uh, four or five times a year, um, kind of. Uh, but I, I wouldn't say that uh, it was religious. I would say, that, and there was certainly no real spirituality, and, or at least I didn't. I, I liked the singing, and I think uh, the rest of my family did too singing in church but it was like christmas eve uh, easter and you know thanksgiving or something right right is that kind of what got you or inspired to music at an early age too uh, my father's a musician and i was encouraged uh, slash forced to play an instrument uh pretty young uh, i played uh, the trumpet uh piano uh for years and uh eventually got into guitar, which I would say was thoroughly uh, therapeutic, uh, relaxing to me, even though playing rock and, and stuff, very healing to play an instrument, I believe. Yeah, why do you think that was? Um, 
Well, why do you think you that know, is? They say that uh, people who are improvising on a musical instrument have their brain lit up, whatever that means. It means that uh, it's just a, um, a way to um, relax and experience hearing and creativity and tactile, tactile and visual experience all, all at once. And, uh, you know, it's it's it becomes a challenge like oh how can i perform or like what's the best ratio of like practicing to performing getting done in any given practice session mm. some people say it should be half and half or something but well it sounds like something you've explored a lot we'll, we'll circle back around to that but so after your early years was there anything that occurred in your life that caused you to uh, either look for a different religion or question the religion that you were being brought up in, even though it wasn't a constant practice? Well, this will be, um, yeah. When I was 14, I was a bit of a juvenile delinquent. Uh, it won't shock you to hear that because you know some of my story. Uh, but um, I took LSD and was like, oh, my goodness, the um, you know, the my sense of, doership, my sense of uh, owning my thoughts or being a, a, an entity within this experience was removed. And as I came down, I realized, wow, I'm going to be spending on some level the rest of my life uh, figuring out how to do this organically rather than taking an object into my body around it. I mean, I, I too remember the experience that I had, you know, the first time I, you know, experienced, you know, a, uh, the results of a substance, you know, at a very young age as well. I was about 14 as well. And, uh, you know, it, it changed my life, unfortunately, not in a great way. But I can say that I chased, I spent many, many years of my life chasing that experience again, right? And it's like, I want to recapture that experience. And that created a lot of drive and energy for me to pursue some very unhealthful pursuits, uh, as it were, and allowing my emotions to control, you know, my decisions as a result of that, you know. Um, mm -hmm. At the same time, you know, after myself getting into recovery uh, many years ago, um, I started to discover other methods, you know, through spirituality you know, um, through spiritual practices that um, have brought me, didn't never brought me back to that experience, but it brought me to places that I would never been able to experience if I were under some influence. Right. The, the path to ascend was, or trans, transform was, was getting clear. Like, I think that uh, Spirituality is is uh, motivated by suffering. Um, like it's only people who really sabotage their own lives repeatedly um, really want to know what the you know the underlying fabric of reality is made of. Like it seems. I mean, some people don't have to get as self destructive as as we were, maybe. But. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, therein you know lies somewhat the sort of purpose of suffering. I think. Well, and I, I think that that just leads us right back into you know it's like so during the process of your recovery you know and maybe before that you started to explore you know some other traditions you know religious or spiritual traditions um, that took you to different places. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Well, I I went through a period in high school where I read the Bible and it's like. Okay, yeah, like I want to be moved by the spirit. I want to believe that something other than, you know, my ego is hanging out here. And um, I did a, actually, not long after high school, I was exposed to an invited teacher, um, Ramesh Balsakar and, uh, and Wayne Lickerman. And, uh, and I, I resonated immediately. I was like, okay non-duality that's um provocative controversial what what's going on um but then um you know i wasn't ready to kind of 
really experience that and uh, did a bunch of non-religious experiencing in the um, as self you know in the 12 step they tell the self is small s little self and it's related to you know self-absorption self-obsession self-centeredness and just did a, a bunch of that trying to you know be a clever human you know getting approval and stuff and uh but it wasn't until a little bit into recovery uh eight and a half years ago that i you know, which and i'd gotten sober a bunch of times um in and out but eight and a half years ago i started getting into buddhism as well which um was another uh it's kind of leaning towards it, but it gets, it alludes to the emptiness, which is possible, which is, yeah. And so when you say emptiness, what do you mean by emptiness? Uh, emptiness is, you know, it's a tricky word because it, it's, yes. it's a word, but um, it's referring to the uh, um, kind of what's, I'll mention the headless way, which is uh, something that was d developed in the 70s uh, by, uh, I'll remember in a minute, but um, Richard Lang has been making it popular again. And it's a way of like experiencing the first person in that I've never seen my head. Um, and when I point to my, where I'm looking out of, uh, I point to essentially an empty space where the world is, where the, the world appears in an empty space. But also um, the emptiness refers to the fact that we, where the belief in a separate self exists or seem to exist, um, when that disappears, it's, it feels like an emptiness, but not in a sad griefy way at all right yeah and i and that's why i asked the question and thank you for clarifying that so clearly um being redundant there <laughs> but um it, it's a distinction you know because people think oh emptiness that means you know kind of like you know hopeless and emptiness and no purpose and things like that but that's not what it means in the spiritual tradition in a spiritual practice you know and where you talk about advaita you know, where it's a singularity, right? It's that non-separation, right? Talk about it's how you really a, got into that. And I may have misspoke that. So why don't you clarify that for me well, too? Um, Advaita means not Advaita. to, as opposed to oneness, because um, oneness is a concept that um, an, a, a, an ego, a self can like say, yeah, I'm, I'm involved in this oneness. Um, so Advaita means not to, meaning it's a negation of the subject-object relationship. Um, for instance, it's possible to, as you look out into the room, to notice that seeing is happening. And typically there's a sense of it. There's me seeing, there's an I looking out, seeing objects. And um, in our actual experience, really, all there is is seeing, and there doesn't need to be a, a subject or an object. There is only the seeing or the hearing or feeling. And so what is perception made of? It's made of experience, experiencing. And what is experiencing made of? knowing and knowing uh is essentially seamless and it's it's happening whether or not there's objects or whether or not i'm asleep or i'm just knowing of experience is really the the one ingredient the awareness knowing or awareness yeah 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 so, so if you take that a little bit further, um, 
How does that unfold in your daily practice? Well, it's an option to consider um, at any time, really. Um, for instance, I can have memories uh, of long ago or yesterday, or I can imagine tomorrow or a year from now. But those memories or fantasies or projections are happening now, and they can also be experienced as perception. And so the perceiving is happening, and I get to remember, like, oh, there's actually not a self here. Like, Tobias is not really here. Like, the, what I thought was here as an individual, the part that gets um, worried about death, that's, um, it's not necessary in order to function in day-to-day -day life. Like, everything uh, I would be doing, can, could be doing, can be doing, can be done without that idea that there's a, a, an I over here, a separate self. Um, so it's not, it's, it's actually quite um, available to anybody at all times. This is it's not like a, a lofty position. It's just uh, a realization that there doesn't need to be a, a me in order to be experiencing. Because culture tells us that we um, are observing objects all the time. There's a subject and an object. And that's actually, um, there, there's some physicists who are uh, named, one, Bernardo Castro is a specific physicist who basically is saying that basically all there is is consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that um, what we see as the world, what we experience as the world is actually uh, mental, transpersonal representations of something that is, but we're seeing it kind of like through our own brain, through a filter, which has got a ton of blind spots. Um, and also, you know, matter doesn't exist. It, it, from the physicist point of view, there's no located, like, stationary, dead, inert matter anyway. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's kind of a deep end uh, answer to, uh, <laughs> and I, I will give credit. I've been listening to a, a lot of Ru uh, Rupert Spira, who's a non-dual teacher, an Advaita man who is qu quite articulate regarding the, you know, that which can't be really spoken about. Yeah, and you've turned me on to him a bit too, and I've listened to some of his material as well. Um, having difficulty just, uh, you know, Comprehending some of the concepts he is discussing uh, is not as uh, not as easily as uh, you know Joe Dispenza or you know some other folks like that you know that I you know can easily relate to in terms of you know you know I, I talk singularity or, or oneness but I like this concept of you know non-duality because that tends to remove you know again like we said that object-subject you know relationship there. And, you know, I, I like using the word wholeness, you know, and I know you've been doing a lot of work in wholeness. I'd love for you to, we've got just about 10 minutes left, but, you know, it's like I'd love for you to talk about how wholeness has, you know, worked to not just transform your life, but help you align your life to where you want it to be. Well, I would say that it's not me that's aligning it. <laughs> right. Well, okay. So correct um, me. Yes, I stand corrected there. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it's um, you turned me on to core transformation, and that was um, you know a spiritual experience, a very new like wow, just yeah. a different access to um, co core states, which, uh, as we know, are states that the various parts. Let me back up a bit and say that there, Bernardo Castro, the physicist, basically his, his model of the universe is that it's mental in the same sense that uh, um, DID people, people with dissociative identity disorder can have like distinct separate personalities. These used to be schizoid personality disorder. Um, he, he making a, uh, an argument for the fact that we 
the people on earth are essentially a, uh, we are all dissociated alters of the one mind, basically in a dream. And um, that can sound very far out and not very grounded to, to some people who, whatever, are not. Uh, it's a different concept for sure. Question. Yeah. Yeah, what it's all made of. But um, yeah, Connie Ray, Andreas, uh, okay. came up with an amazing way to uh, relate to parts of you know, the personality. And you know, be curious and investigate what parts want, as you know. And parts, you know, no matter what they uh, are acting like, if the one of them has a bad habit of overeating or um, swearing too much or whatever, we can we can say, "What? Where is this part?" Yeah. And uh, okay, let's thank it for being here. And it might be, you know, one part of the body it could be outside the body and uh yeah we can basically set a dialogue and start a dialogue like what do you want yeah and it might say wants protection or um, wants you know nourishment or something right. and then we will ask like okay so step into that part kind of talking to ourselves in a way step into that Experience it fully. Yeah. Nourishment. And what do you want through having nourishment? That's even deeper. Yeah. We can go into this and come to a core state, which would be something like oneness or okayness or being, and kind of give parts of us what they really want, which is to integrate with um, you know our whole system. And wholeness is a variation on that that. Uh, can can be uh, it's actually slightly different because it's not dealing with state, but lo locations can be seen from different points of view, maybe in the mind's eye, and felt from different points of view in a kinesthetic sense. And then at some point, a part will welcome the invitation to relax and open yeah. as awareness. Yeah. Which of course does not need objects to be. Right. So um, yeah. Yes. To answer your question, it's been yeah. uh, amazing to just lose tons of psychic weight. Like yeah. tons of you know, it's quieter. It's there's less thinking going, on, less ruminating. Yeah. Because there's fewer parts that don't know, you know that are confused. Right. Yeah, you know, and as a result of that, if there's less thinking, that means that there's more experiencing. Right, right. Direct. You know, and, you know, one thing that I want to point out, too, you know, as you were describing, you know, the core transformation process a bit, um, you know, it, it's a way of acknowledging my entire self. You know, there's a part of me that wants this and there's a part of me that doesn't want that, you know, and we argue and we debate and that creates thoughts and it creates distractions, it creates disagreement, it creates discomfort within self, right? And so I recognize for myself, you know, through using the core transformation methodologies, that I no longer have to um, tell part of me that it doesn't have a right to exist or be here. You know, mm. it's like I can bring it in. It's like I am one whole in being included. included, you know, and it's like once I've learned how to include all of myself as part of my greater self, there's unconditional love that shows up. There's patience. There's compassion. There's trust. There's security, you know, et cetera. And, and so many different levels that I've looked for in all my life through so many different things, including drugs and alcohol and what have you. But I've looked for these things in so many ways. And, you know, one of my previous guests said, you know, it's like everything that I've always wanted to find out and want for myself is already here. You know, it's already here. You know, and yeah, it's very hard for the self, the small the sense of self, yeah. to uh, experience like the, even the idea that happiness and fulfillment are our actually our, our true nature. That seems like a beautiful nonsense statement yeah. to to the heart. But uh, yeah, it's yeah. 
you know, we'll talk a bit later also about, um, at some point, about, uh, I just want to mention this guy, Paul uh, Beddington, or, or mm, where is he? he he's a 12-step he's a guy that is also a Vita, and he's talking about how, like, the bondage itself is the underlying, the cause and condition of our need to escape mm. the self. Mm -hmm. um, is essentially solved by the experience of our true nature, um, realizing that there is no subject object, there is only experience and knowing experience. So, what? Uh, I was just going to say, so somehow we've only got a couple minutes left here. Our time has okay. just like flown by. So, being you myself, could, yeah. <laughs> being myself, it's um, one of many rubric books I have, and I just want to. You asked about spirituality, and I just want to say this. Please, you know, yeah, go for it. Um, the apparent existence of things is borrowed from that which truly is, God's infinite being. Just as the apparent reality of objects in a movie is borrowed from the reality, relatively speaking, of the screen. Things don't have their own existence. Being has things. Selves don't have awareness. Awareness has selves. We do not think of things because they exist. They seem to exist because we think of them. Thought abstracts discrete objects and selves from the reality of God's infinite and indivisible being. To feel this reality in the midst of experience is to know beauty and love. It is God's presence shining in and as existing. Yeah, what a relief. I actually wrote a um, haiku earlier. A bird chirps. There is only, wait, there is only hearing. Wow. Phew, what a relief. <laughs> I knew it was the haiku game. <laughs> that was awesome. But that is all the time we have, my friend. Thank you so much for making time for us today. Uh, thank you to my guest, Tobias English. Appreciate you. And we will again be talking very soon. Love all right. you, Roberto. Blessings, brother. And just a few closing remarks and a shout out to today's executive producer and sponsor, Bridge to Heaven Healing and Leap and Lizards, which is the premier source for healing crystals and readings with four locations, including 120 Center Street, Auburn, Maine. You can visit www.leapinlizards.biz for more information. Also, a big thanks to our co-executive producer, Dr. Annika Becca, the creator of Mighty Maca Plus, the daily nourishing supplement that improves metabolism and reinvigorates the body. Visit drannikabeka.com for more information. Also, if you would like to get more information about this show, to reach out to us, or to sponsor us, please visit www.deepbeing.org. We would love to hear from you. And a quick shout out to the crew, director Patrick McCartan, audio and sound Warren, and cameras Travis Nadeau, as well as to the Portland Media Center and their team, Tom, Dino, and Warren. We wouldn't be here without them. Thank you for watching Enlightened Pathways and spending your valuable time with us today. Until next time, play, have fun, be happy.